Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Vinnie Tolman, and he has got an amazing experience because he was dead 45 minutes in a body bag in the back of the squat. <laughs> That's unusual. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit of an odd one, right? <laughs> and I love the character that jumped back there and started undoing that bag. That's just amazing. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I mean, it is a, a miracle that I I am right here right now, for sure. I mean, it is. I was I was dead and gone to the world, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to um, flip the screen on you. You'll be seeing me, but they'll be seeing you once it gets processed. So okay. I'll just take the floor, okay? Okay. All right. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Vinny Tolman or Vincent Todd Tolman, and um, and this is my NDE. I uh, I was 25 years old when I I took a supplement and a fairly new supplement um, that I had purchased online. Me and me and my best friend we had taken the supplement quite a bit for a few months and found it was sold out everywhere. So we went online to buy it and found that the stuff that you buy online is not the exact same as what we were buying in the United States. And we discovered that the hard way um, by poisoning ourselves, by taking it. It's, it's much stronger, 20 times stronger than the American stuff. So we took our normal dose, which was just a little bottle cap of this liquid. And when we took it, uh, right off the bat, we knew something was wrong. And we decided, hey, let's go get something to eat. Maybe that'll um, push off the nausea and, and what's going on here. And so we went off to a little burger joint down the street. Um, we pull in there. My buddy goes, or I went in first to the bathroom, locked the door. My buddy went into the dining room and, and kind of collapsed on one of the dining tables and uh, started vomiting all over the table. Meanwhile, I'm in the bathroom behind a locked door. And um, they went ahead and called 911 for my buddy and took him away. Uh, meanwhile, I'm in the bathroom. I did uh, lose my, my balance and fall back and, and pass out. But I was on my back when I passed out. And so I started to aspirate as I, I vomited. <clears throat> and, you know, the body was reacting really toxically to this, this supplement. It was poisonous for us in this, in this uh, strength that was very poisonous. So the body wanted to get it out of, out of the body. And, and, and so I, I laid there on the floor and died. The next thing I remember is, is this, this very cold plunge. It felt like I was dipped into cold, like a cold electricity. And, and, and before I knew it, I, something started to, to come into focus in front of me. And it seemed like a movie screen to me. It really did. It seemed like a movie screen that I was watching, but it wasn't square like a movie screen. It was, you know, round, like, but it, but I was seeing this, 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 this scene and I was seeing it from above. I was seeing it from above and watching this little restaurant do its thing, you know, people serving, getting served with food and seeing that nobody knew there was a dead body in the bathroom. And, I, and you could know just by looking at the body, it was dead, had no life. The, the face was all discolored. It was yellow and purple. And the neck was swollen really wide. It was actually wider than the jaw. It was like really wide. And uh, you could tell whatever that was, it was not a living human anymore. And, and as weird as it is to say, I didn't know it was me. I didn't know at all because me was up here experiencing this and watching this, this play out. So in no way did I ever think that that was me right there. I thought me is here and, and it didn't even for a second think that that was me. So I, I uh, am observing this and I noticed that one of the customers kept trying to open the bathroom door. And after a couple, a couple attempts, he went and got the manager to open the door. The manager sees this dead guy on the ground, calls 911. Um, they, they reach out and touch the body and feel it's cold. And they told the 911 operator that. And she said, you know what, go ahead and just secure the body, close, close and lock the door. Don't let anybody in there. Wait for the medics to come. So they waited for the medics to come. They unlock the door and show them this body. And the medics uh, do some preliminary attempts. Now you're watching all this it. still. You're just staying there. Yeah. Hanging out. And, and, and a, an oddball thing is I was noticing I could actually hear the thoughts of everyone, everyone, including the medics who showed up. And it's weird, but there was three medics. There was two veterans and one, one rookie. And the rookie, I kept feeling them uh, have this feeling like 
we need to do something else. We need to do something else. We need to try harder. We could try this. We could try this. Uh, he was he was thinking all of these technical things that they could try, and and the two veterans are like, nope. You know, after they did some chest compressions, they put a little mask. They they tried to force some oxygen in the mouth. Nothing was happening. So they did pronounce me dead there. They put me promptly in a body bag. They secured me to a, a one of these boards, a body board and uh, put me in the back of an ambulance on top of a gurney. And I was, I was, you know, strapped all over the place. Um, and, and as they were doing, doing processing the body, um, I'm watching all this go on. I keep hearing the thought of this rookie. Like, I, I wish they would let me try. I wish they would let me try this. I, you know, I wish we could do more. Um, and he kept thinking, this is my first week. I can't believe I'm going to watch a dead guy on my first week at this job. And, um, you know, going through the whole process, uh, I'm watching it all happen. They, it takes a few minutes for them to sign paperwork with the manager of the restaurant. A police officer shows up, he signs paperwork, they exchange some paperwork, and then they pull away from the scene. As they pull away from the scene, they're about a block away or a block and a half away when, from my observation, this rookie is sitting in the back of the ambulance with the body where the two veteran medics are in the front. And all of a sudden this light, literally a light started to glow from inside his heart space, like the, where your heart is on the body. It literally started to glow just right there. Um, and as it did, I felt this really strong force go over my left shoulder where I was, where I was watching this happen. I felt this force go over my left shoulder and hit him. I saw it hit him. I, I, I knew it hit him. And very loudly I heard, this one's not dead. And I heard it so loud and, and I knew he heard it too, because as soon as he heard it, he started looking around and, and looking to see where that came from. He thought about it for a second and then he kind of shrugged it off um, after just a, a couple of moments and, and realized, you know what? Um, no, I, I must've been imagining it. So he, he just kept thinking about, you know, his job and everything and we, they went about another block and this glow that was still glowing around his heart space, it, it expanded. It went wider and taller. It went above his head all the way to his waist. He, he himself was glowing. Light was coming from inside of him. And then this force a second time went over my shoulder and hit him. And it said very, very strongly, this one's not dead. And from that he reacted. He knew he, it wasn't his imagination. He did look to the other two medics to whether he was looking to see if it was them or he's looking to see if they were watching him. I don't know. But as he looked to them, he realized they weren't watching him. So he went ahead and started going to work. He un, undid a strap, um, a couple of straps right here around the neck area, unzipped the body bag and was feeling around, uh, feeling around like the neck area for a pulse, um, felt inside the arm, didn't, didn't feel a pulse there. Um, and actually when he was feeling, it was actually like around the jawbone area, he's feeling for a pulse. Then the, the, the armpit, still no pulse. And the body is cold and there's stiffness going on. There's actually hardness to the muscle now. And then he goes to, to undo a couple more straps on the body, unzips the body bag further and went into the inside leg. And there, as he pushed to, to feel for a big artery there, he pushed through and, and made contact with the femur bone on my leg. And, and as he made that contact, that, that contact, that, that, that touching to the, the femur bone, I felt a shock, a physical shock where I was sitting. And I knew he felt it too. He felt a spark or a shock. And it was enough for him that even though it wasn't a pulse, it was something, and it was something that he couldn't explain. So he went ahead and began the, the process of resuscitating the body. You know, he started um, trying to get oxygen into the lungs. He hooked up a defibrillator to the, the chest. And, uh, and as soon as the defibrillator started to make the alarm sound, that before it, 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 you know, charges the body or sends electricity to the body, it makes this alarm sound to, to pull your hands away from the body. As it was doing that, um, the, the other two medics in the front of the ambulance, they started to notice what he was doing. And they, they just really ripped into this guy and said, 
you're an idiot. You can't do this. You're going to get fired. You could get arrested. This is illegal. You need to let this be alone. You're not supposed to experiment or do these things on dead bodies. And they're, they're just kind of going to town on him. And it, it didn't dissuade him at all. He went ahead and let the first charge hit and there was nothing. Then he let the, let it charge a second time and it, and it, it hit. And at the second hit of the defibrillator, there was a single heartbeat, a single, and it was on its own. And so they went ahead to a, he went ahead to a third round of charge. And on the third round, it started a very faint but steady heartbeat on its own. So the, the heart did start back up on its own. Um, now the body did start to do all sorts of weird things that, that, um, I've only experienced this one time from the outside of myself. I've never experienced ever before a, a body coming back to life before. And it's very unpleasant, but the body started going through this very, very hard phase of coming back to life. once that heart started, but the miracle of this whole experience was that when the heart was started, they were only about a block or a block and a half from a hospital with a, a cardiology specialty team that was there. So they were ready to, to meet the body as soon as it, the, the heart started. Within seconds, there was a hospital there. They were at the hospital. They turned the, you know, the body into them. They started working on it there. At this point, they started to strap the body down, and they were putting straps around the legs because the body was going to seizures. There's all sorts of mucus stuff coming out of the nose, there's even stuff coming out of the ears. Um, you know, there's a lot going on with that body as it was going into seizures. And, and so they're strapping it down to, so that they could administer or work on this body. As they did that, they strapped the two legs, they strapped the right arm. And then as they went to go strap the left arm, I, I looked down to where I was. I felt like I was sitting in a, a comfortable chair. I looked down to where my left arm was. And what I was seeing was the left arm of that, that body. And I was watching them pull it down. I felt them strap that left arm. That was the first time or the first inkling I had that what I was witnessing was my own death. That literally what I was just watching was my own death. And there, there was some, some very strong fear about that. And I went through kind of a negative spin of energy where I thought, you're an idiot. How did you not know what you're watching was your own death? And, um, Within a moment of that, though, I started to feel this light and this love, this warmth, and it started to warm me from behind, from my back forward. And as it did, I started to see all the good things I ever did in my life. And I saw the impact of those things, that, how, how they happened, how they kind of the, the ripple effect of good that I had done, opposed to what the bad I'd ever done in my life. And, and I felt just this overtaking of love coming over me. And I felt it coming from behind me. So I turned around to see who, who or what was sending this energy to me. And I, there I see this guy. I see this gentleman. He's, uh, he's, he's older looking. He's got long white hair. He's got a long white beard. He's got a white suit on with a white robe over the suit. And his skin is very, very pink. Um, but, but what's funny, even though his hair looked like he was old, his skin looked like he was in his 20s or 30s even though it was very, you know, very old looking as far as the beard and the hair, his skin looked very young, um, but it glistened. His skin glistened like sand at the beach. You know, as the sun's setting at the beach, you can see the glistening of the sand. That's what his skin did. It glistened like that. And, and I noticed that the light was literally coming out of him. It was emitting out of him. And that all of this thing, all of this stuff that I was feeling <clears throat> was being orchestrated or being being brought to me by him by this gentleman and so seeing that 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 is happening of course my response is are you god and he just kind of he kind of smiled and 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 responded to me without using words uh just just responded a thought no son i'm not god and i thought that was odd that we were able to talk that way without using words and realize that in this space, you don't need words. Without the physical body, you don't need words. It's just uh, pure understanding back and forth. So as you have a thought, they have an answer. And um, so he, he said, no, son, I'm not God. And so my follow-up was, well, 
you don't look like him, but are you Jesus? <laughs> you know, and uh, he laughed about that too and, and said, no, I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here to be your guide. Uh, you can call me Drake and I'm going to help you go where you want to go. You can go back to where you just came from where any kind of motion towards that, ex what I was watching on the other side of me of the exit, them trying to bring that body back. And it looked horrible, by the way, all this, all the poking, prodding, injecting uh, that they were doing to that body looked horrible. And I didn't want that. I wanted whatever he had and wherever he was going. And so I, I expressed that, that, that I wanted to go wherever he was going and, and he said, okay, I can help you see what's next in this life. Um, and he helped me understand that this life goes for eternities before this, and it goes for eternities after this, and that we, we make this little stop here on earth in what he considered a classroom, not a courtroom, a classroom where we're able to, to learn and to listen to our intuition and listen to God and to love and to create and that's what we're here to do. And, and he explained that to me and, and showed me that, um, that he could take me on this journey to see what's next for me, what's next specifically for me. And I said, let's, let's go, let's do this. And he explained also that it was going to be not just a journey of moving from space to space, but it was going to be a journey of moving from space of lower understanding to a new space of much higher understanding or higher frequency. He used the term frequency because I understood it. So I understood frequency very well. And he used that terminology to me that we had to go to from a very low density, um, um, low, low state or low frequency state here in our third dimension and go to a very high dimensional state where, where it's a very high frequency and high energy, high love. And um, I said, let's go. So kind of a funny thing, I was raised Christian. I thought that I was, I had this special little key to the back door of heaven that, you know, I'm Christian. So I got my, my Christian key. Where do I go open the back door to heaven? I know that's where I go. Cause that's where, that's where the good Christians are supposed to go. Right. And, um, and he said that, you know, it's not like that, that there's, there's a lot more to it that there's that, um, that, that, Christianity has a path to heaven, but, but more importantly, God has a path of love for all of his creations. Um, and, and God really loves all of his creations and wants to bring about um, the salvation of, of the soul or the bring about the evolution of the soul, the growth of the soul through love by coming to earth. And, um, and that, that there wasn't just one, single path that there was many different paths into many different heavens but this specific heaven where i was going to go we had to go through the front door and he says that's the hardest one because you have to you have to really understand some major eternal under he called, called them understandings i call them principles but i had to understand and and embody these 10 primary principles um, for me to get there and he didn't lay it out as 10 principles, but essentially that's what I break it down to is from what he was showing me, there's essentially 10 major principles of that. And, um, and I had to embody that. And those 10 principles are, are number one, be authentic. We have to be authentic before we can grow in this space, in the third dimension and the higher dimensions, that the false side of us is these false faces that we put on ourselves you know, around different people that we're around, that we need to put our authentic face, our authentic personality, no matter where we go, we're the same being. And once we can be that, um, then we can grow the most. And what's funny is in our life, typically you only find that in small children and you only find that in, in the very old, those, you know, who are, you know, at the very end of their life, they're to that point where they are authentic. They're not trying to, they're not trying to go out and be anybody that they're not. They are who they are and they're unapologetic about it, which is good. We want to be authentically who we are and, and not try to be something that we're not. And um, that authenticity is the foundation of where you can begin growing. You can begin creating your existence, begin creating who you really are. Um, but next is, is understanding that the purpose of life 
is for us to come here and learn how to create, learn how to grow, learn, 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 learn. And, and how do we learn? And it's the, the third principle, it's love. We have to learn how to love. We have to use love as the power or the tool to help us learn everything. And, um, and then it, that brought me to the fourth principle, which is listening to your inner voice or listening to your intuition from God. And, and all of us have this, all of us have a strong intuition. It's just, as we get older, we, we tend to turn it off. We tend to turn away from it because we're afraid of it. It scares us. It doesn't make sense. Um, but, but my guide Drake, he showed me that that intuition, listening to that inner voice, it's there for a reason. And many times it can, it can really bless our lives and bless the lives of those around us. If we have a strong relationship with that intuition, with, with God, with that love from God. And next is to, is to use technology responsibly, use our modern technology in a responsible way. And, and then next was releasing prejudice, removing prejudice from your life, even, even being prejudiced against prejudiced people, which I didn't realize that's what I did. That's what I did have is I, I wasn't prejudiced, but I was prejudiced against prejudiced people. So that in itself is prejudice. So I joined their club by not liking them or, or thinking they were bad. Right. So I, I need to not judge anybody and not be prejudiced against anyone, even though they might not have truth or they might be living a false path. That's their path. I need to not judge them and not have prejudice at all. Um, and that, and that is where it gives you power to exercise the power of creation. And that's what the seventh principle was, is, is from there, when you release your prejudice, you can really embody creation in a way without prejudice. Right. And then, um, number eight is that is as we create, we want to avoid negative influences. And that was the, the eighth principle is, is recognizing that there is negative influences and avoid them. And then number nine, understanding the purpose of those negative influences or understanding the purpose of evil. Why is there evil? And, and the same way that um, if we didn't have evil, we wouldn't have free agency. We have to have free agency. There has to be a down if there's an up, right? So if we want to grow up, there has to be a down. There has to, for, for there to be good, there has to be evil. So they work together in, in synchronicity that, that we get to choose where we go with our choices, with how we create our life. But it's important to have both those factors. It is. And then the last and 10th principle is to know that we are all one, that we are all fingers on God's hand. So for me over here as the thumb, to hate the first finger is only to hate myself. And, and for me to pr be prejudiced against anyone is to only be prejudiced against myself and to understand that we are all fingers on God's hand, all of us, and that, that all of us are creations of God and we are connected at the core of who we are. And that's what makes us family. We're all family to each other. And it's important that, you know, to harm another is to harm oneself, but more importantly, to love and serve another is to love and serve oneself which is a very beautiful thing. Um, and, and yeah, it was these 10 major principles that I had to learn and embody. And, and within each one of those principles, I could literally speak for a day, probably an entire day on each one of those principles, how to, you know, how to really embody that principle um, just from what I had learned. And um, it's, it's, it's quite an experience to go through and, and experience these truths that I, it's weird because as I learned them, I felt like I already, I already knew that my whole life, I already knew it, but yet it took, it took me dying to learn how to live and to remember what the rules were because I, you know, being raised the, in, in Western American culture and the way I was um, specifically, I was raised very much in the, in, and, you know, the, the testosterone culture of, I did a lot of like MMA type fighting and, and training and as well as weightlifting and sports, football and rugby. And um, I, I was really, and not that any of those things are bad at all. I don't judge that in any of that stuff. I love, I love anybody who loves that stuff. But I, 
but what I didn't realize is that I was not, I was not embodying, I was not embodying, I was not embodying who I was with all those things. Who I was, was at the core of all that. And I was more than that. Um, and yeah, it was, it was um, really a, a beautiful thing though, to, to go through and learn these, these principles that I, I already knew, but I had to kind of remember to make my progress to heaven. And by the time I got through that last one, that, that we are all one, I could very easily see heaven by there and see that it was a huge, huge planet. And I'm bigger than our sun, much bigger than our sun. And um, just an amazing, beautiful place, a beautiful space that, that, um, that embodies the light and power of creation. And that this earth is a, a shadow of that, that um, earth itself on its best day is a very dark shadow compared to that light that's there. But what's beautiful is if, if earth is as, as bad as it gets, it only gets better from here, which is really good. Um, it's a, a, a beautiful thing to know that that heaven is out there for us. And, and to know that we have that as our, our path or our, our future. And um, yeah, so as we, we came about and started seeing this planet, um, I started to notice uh, kind of some, some weird things that there was no sun. I was looking around for a sun because, you know, I understand astrology and understand our solar system, how it works. And, and I, I was to, I was helped to understand that in heaven, light doesn't come from outside the source the way it does on earth. The way we receive light is from a remote sun and it sends that light to us. And then that's what facilitates life here. Um, but the light there comes from inside the objects. So from inside, um, the, the planet itself glows. The, the plants on the planet glow. They, they all just emit light, bright white light. And it's just a beautiful thing. Um, and I could tell that the, the frequency or energy of someone on the physical earth could not exist there. That it's such a high energy, it's even higher than the energy of our sun that um, it would take a lot for us to get there. Um, that's why we have to peel off those, these physical bodies to get there, is we have to go to a very high energetic state, um, kind of take our soul and vibrate it at this high frequency of love, kind of the way the hummingbird wings vibrate around us and we can't see them because they, they beat so fast. It's, it's like our energy, our love energy has to get that level so we could even get into heaven. And, and really the only limits to heaven are us, just us. There's no, there's no, um, no fence uh, around heaven saying you can't get in. The, the only fence is internal. It's us preventing ourselves from getting in if we don't want to get in. In fact, I noticed this kind of haze, this, this kind of cloudy haze around the outside of the planet of heaven itself. And as we got closer and closer, I saw that the haze was built of all these big orbs, these big orbs of light. And the orbs themselves um, embodied um, spirits or souls. And they were just um, ridding themselves of negative energy. And Drake, my guide, he helped me see inside one of these. And, and I got to see the, this gentleman from, from probably Italy or, or the Italian culture. And uh, from around the late 1800s, early 1900s, really angry at his son, um, expelling the anger that he had towards his son, the betrayal he felt, the victimness that he felt by his son's hand. And when he got to the very end of it, he, he took like this deep breath and realized, oh, what I thought I was talking to my son this whole time, he's not even there. And I don't even know where I am. He started to look around and realized, he was all surrounded by light. And as soon as he, he recognized that he had got that out of him and had stopped saying the negative energy and stopped getting that out of him, then he was surrounded by these angels and then he was gone. He was taken into heaven um, that quick, just so quick, so fast. And that's what these, the, that's what the, you know, the pearly gate is, is these pearls or these orbs of energy that that's the only thing keeping us out of heaven is us. 
is we will enter one of these so we can rid ourselves of negative energy, negative um, behaviors, thoughts, uh, um, actions. Um, some might have vices or, or habits that you need to rid yourself of. And, and what these are is they're kind of little um, decompression chambers so that we can get that negative frequency or negative energy off of us so that we can match the energy of heaven and go to heaven. So that's, that was the pearly gate is, is all these orbs of, of light that help people so they can, they can transfer into the, into heaven's gate or into heaven itself. And I noticed that, that the planet of heaven itself is, is so vast and huge. And where we were touching down is in this, this one corner that, that there's a little river and a little lake and a little hill and there's a forest and some tree, you know, trees in the forest, some flowers and, and just hills and hills of beautiful grass and beautifully snow capped mountains in the background that I could see. And um, it was just so pristine and beautiful there. Um, and like I said before, the light was coming from inside of everything. It wasn't coming from an outside sun. So like the grass emitted light, the grass emitted love. It emitted a, a sound like a beautiful music. It even emitted a flavor out of it that even to be near it or to touch it, you could taste it. You could, you could embrace and experience the love of the grass, like who the grass was existed to love me. And I existed to love the grass. And, and it was just very symbiotic with everything there, with the trees and the flowers and, and the water, the healing power of the water was just so beautiful. And, and um, as I'm experiencing all this, I do notice that there's a building off on top of this hill over to my side. And I asked Drake, you know, what is that? Is that heaven? And he's like, no, heaven's here. And, and he explained that there's, there's many aspects to heaven that there's not just one version of heaven, that every soul that goes there gets their version that they need. And that what I was witnessing in this building, it was the university or the place that people go to learn. And you could learn any of the knowledge of the universe, anything you wanted to learn without the perversions or without the influences of, of, of manipulation or power. You know, you could learn eternal eternal truths in this this space that he called like the university and so um i noticed a lot of people going in and out of this building and the building would just form an opening as a group arrived and if if the group didn't match the frequency of that room they knew to keep going to the next room and then when they matched that frequency the room opened up and they go in it was just really beautiful and this building was built out of one piece of marble and it was living it was like it was glowing in itself and the building love that it existed for the, 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 the purpose of learning and, and lovingly learning and, and love that it existed for that and did it in, in love for those who attended this place. And as I'm experiencing all this, it's just so overwhelming and it's more than words can describe. It is, I mean, the colors alone, there's, there's billions of colors there that we don't have here. Um, and it, it's, it's so hard to describe that as we're going through all of this though. Um, I'm, I've learned so much. I've made it all the way here. I'm really loving this space. And I feel like I'm, I'm finally home. I'm finally where I knew my home was. And then, um, Drake comes to me and he puts his energy close to me and says, Vinny, I know this is going to be hard but it's going to be worth it. And he came, he came together to me and hugged me in the way that, that spirits and souls can do there. And we became one for a second, as we did in this hug, the cores of who we are came together, almost like um, a nuclear core coming together with another nuclear core. And there was just this vast expanse of love and energy between the two of us. It was otherworldly is more than words can describe as I'm experiencing the, the most beautiful thing I'd ever experienced in my life with this, this experience of this hug from him. I see, I see just this, all these colors and, and things going around me. And now all of a sudden I hear in my ear, I hear my own brother, my brother from earth. I hear his voice start to say a prayer over my, 
my physical body in the hospital. And now, now mind you, this is three days past now. So they, they turned my body into the hospital. It had just been resuscitated. It, the body was in a coma for three days. So I'm in the hospital brain dead for three days. And my brother is the third day praying over my body. And I'm hearing it live in my ear. Where, I, where I'm at in heaven, I'm hearing it live. And as he, he, he says this special blessing or prayer over me, he closes it and ends it. And I feel that my agency or my choice was removed from me at that point. And I was, I was forcibly moved back into my body. I was forcibly put back into my body. And, and next thing I know, I'm waking up in a hospital and I didn't remember anything about my experience yet. I, uh, it was all black to me. I couldn't remember even going to the, couldn't even clearly remember going to the, the restaurant before I died. I could, I could remember getting in the car to go there, but I couldn't remember actually getting there. And um, all of this is going on. I'm, I'm waking up in a hospital and there's all sorts of just tubes and tangles and sensors and, and, and stuff coming out of me. And I just yanked it all out of me, all of it, even the catheter, the IVs, everything. I yanked them all out, had a tube going out in my mouth, yanked that out, yanked everything out and, and got it off of me. And I felt, I just felt like I had to stand there and just breathe for a minute, just take some deep breaths and realize that it was very healing to stand there and breathe. <clears throat> and I've actually really focused on that since my experience that having very focused breaths can really change your energy, especially in times of, spre- of stress and times of um, chaos and anxiety um, <clears throat> or fear. It, you know, breath is a really good way to get out of that. And, and that really helped me to sit there and just breathe deeply. And then I was looking around, there's all these alarm bells going off in the room because uh, I just disconnected everything. And so I went around and unplugged stuff because I was like, oh, I don't want alarms going off. So I unplugged all the equipment that I could find the plugs on. And then I realized, oh, you're naked. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm naked. So I had to go find a gown and I like wrapped it around my middle section. And I just felt like I needed to get out of there. I felt so claustrophobic, even though you know, I was standing there naked. I still felt so claustrophobic. So I went out to the, to the hallway and I, I kind of half joggingly ran down to the, to where I could see there was an elevator and I was hitting the down button when I heard a scream and it was a nurse who had gone into my room and saw there was nobody there. She felt like the body snatchers had come and taken my body. So she screamed. Another nurse went in there. She looked around. They both came out in the hallway and they both saw me and I knew I was toast. I knew I had to go go back to the room that they they essentially would get in trouble if I didn't go back. So I did. I went back and and let him sit me down on the on the hospital bed. I wouldn't let him put anything else on me except for this little little thing on my finger for I think oxygen or something or heart rate or one of those things. They they kept taping it on my finger and the second they would leave the room, I'd pull it off. <laughs> I just I hated having anything touching my body at all. And so from, and now I woke up at one eleven in the morning, um, the third day. And, and from that time until 7 a.m., around 7, 7.30, when I was released, I, I had to fight with them the whole time. They didn't want to release me. They wanted to keep me for a day or two just to observe me. And I said, no, I'm fine. I know I'm fine. I can tell you anything that you need to know. And, and I, I went through a battery of tests. Went literally for four or five hours straight, I was doing just test after test after test with all the different departments too, with cardiology, neurology, with, uh, with all the different de- departments. I was doing all these tests with cognitive function, everything. And I passed all of them um, pretty much that they, they were okay letting me go. But I did have to sign a big liability paperwork that, that said I couldn't sue the hospital if something did bad happen to me. So I did go ahead and sign all that and get out of that hospital. My dad came to pick me up at 7. 7, 7.30 that morning and took me home. And the first thing I did is I went up, went in my, in my room, changed and, and put on some jogging shoes and jogging shorts and went for a jog. I went running for like two hours. I still felt slow claustrophobic, so claustrophobic. And, and the, the odd thing is I, I still didn't remember anything yet. I didn't. It was all black for me. I couldn't remember anything. It was completely blank. And it wasn't until the following day, I went out to dinner with my sister and she cornered me and said, hey, she said, she said, hey, 
did you know that you were dead? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, everyone tells me I'm, you know, at the hospital, they were all calling me the miracle boy. And, and I'm like, yeah, everyone calls me the miracle boy, I guess. But I don't remember any of it. And she goes, well, did you have a near death experience? Because you were dead. And what's so weird is in my mind, I formed the words no. And as I went to go say the words no, what came out of me and what downloaded to me was my whole experience. My whole experience was already there, just needed, to, needed that like help or nudge to open up. And the second she asked that, it started to come out of me. I started to cry, started to bawl like a little baby. And that's not who I am. Or it's not who I was then, especially. I was a very tough, tough guy at that time. And, and I'm still a tough guy, but in a different toughness now. But, but back then, I was a very t worldly tough guy. I wouldn't cry around anybody, no matter what. And I just bawled like a little baby. I couldn't, I, every time I talk about my guy, Drake, I just start crying because he, he loved me so much. <laughs> I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> he loved me so much. I'd never felt love like that, ever. And I was raised in, in a, a, a little bit of a rough home. I had an awesome mom. Um, she wasn't perfect, but she was amazing. And she was an angel. And, and my dad was pretty rough on me in, in lots, of, lots of ways. And, and so I was raised with that. I had a lot of, um, I'll just call it dark holes or black holes that were in me before I died. And after I died, it was erased. And it was erased by my guy, Drake. And, and what he did was he brought the love of God to me. He brought it directly to me and he, he essentially wiped away or cleaned the slate for me. And here I was starting new and I had to, I had to, to relearn how to live. I did in a new way because I was worth living all of a sudden. And I didn't quite feel that before, even though by the world standards, I was very successful in all this. I wasn't, I didn't feel it. I didn't embody it. And, and, um, and it was different after that experience. So every time I tried to, express it to anybody I would just bawl and cry and that was until I met my wife you know a few a few weeks later I met meet meet a girl that's just she's one of these earth angels and I could see it I could see heaven in her eyes I literally could see heaven in her eyes and and that's where I built my future and and fast forward months later I was in this little town in Wyoming at a family reunion sitting at a high school watching a play about the history of the town and they're doing this slideshow of, on the movie screen at the football field. They're doing a little slideshow of these different founders of the town and what they contributed and what they did to make this town, this little town of Afton in Star Valley, Wyoming. And up comes this, this image of this man. And <laughs> my wife, she, she, she points to him and says, that's your guide. And I was looking at her and I turned and looked at him. And I froze. I completely froze. It felt like somebody took a cold bottle of water and poured it over me. I froze because in, in front of me was the very man who was my guide in heaven. So up until this point, I had a side of me that said, you know what? Maybe you're just delusional. Maybe you're making this up. I didn't know who Drake was at this point. And, and now all of a sudden I'm seeing Drake. I see him in front of me. In, in larger than life, this huge, huge picture of him on a football field on a movie screen. And I froze. I couldn't even speak about it. My wife knew. She's like, you got to get out of here. So we left. And, and the very next day, I went and talked with my grandmother. And, and I saw that the name under the picture said Charles Kazare. And that didn't match with what he called himself. He called himself Drake. So I went to my grandma and I go, Grandma, you're a Kazare. Do you know, do you know a Charles Kazare? And she goes, oh, you mean great grandpa Drake? And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's my, there's my angel Drake. And um, it's just amazing. Really beautiful of it. That, um, and there's your confirmation. Yeah. And I, sorry. Ooh, I take a deep breath. Um, yeah, it was just, it was confirmation to me that, that all of it was organized, that all of it happened the way it was supposed to happen. And that there was purpose behind it. And, and I was supposed to, um, I was told right from the get go that I was told to share my experience with people when they needed it. And so for a long time, for 10 years, I shared it verbally and only verbally. I wouldn't write it down for anybody. I did. I felt it was too sacred for that. 
And, and for the longest time, I would only share it verbally to people. And it got to a point where I, I was getting people demanding that I go to these churches and share it with big groups. And, and I decided, you know what? I need to pray about this. I need to really meditate on this. If, if there's a, a way to honor my experience, to put it down in a written form, I need to figure that out. And, and I got very clearly right away um, a confirmation from my own intuition that, that I did need to get it down in a written form so that, that people who needed it, they could reach out and they could find it and see it and discover it. And they could find those, those, those important principles that I learned, you know. I still try to embody those principles every day. I really do. Uh, am I perfect at it? No way. I'm still human. I'm still here. Um, but I'm trying. And it's important that I know about it. And it's important that we all, you know, those who are ready for something like this, that they can know about it too. And, and so I worked with a, a very talented and gifted writer that together we wrote, wrote the whole experience up and wrote, wrote the light after death. And, and, and it's been an amazing journey in the process. It's taken a long time. It's taken almost 10 years um, since I decided that I was going to write it, like truly write it down. It's taken 10 years and, and the actual writing of it took a little over two years to, to get it into the book format and get it published and everything. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a journey, but I'm, I'm grateful to be here where I am now where it's, it's out and it's impacting a lot of lives. Is it for everybody? Absolutely not. I don't want it to be for everybody. I want it to be for those who want it and those who need it. Um, and, and many people read it and it speaks to their soul. Other people, um, it doesn't speak to their soul. I don't, I don't, I don't want to think that it's for everybody, but it is for, for those who it does speak to your soul. So it, it helps you connect and get closer to God, most of us. And that's really my purpose with writing it is to help all of us understand that we have divinity within us, all of us, and that God does um, reside, a, a piece of God resides in all of us because we are God's creations and that there's divinity in that. And to honor our divinity, we need to learn and master the power of love and creation and, and learn the rules, learn the rules of the game so that we can do better every day. And that's what, that's what it's all about is doing better every day so we can raise our frequency, raise that love so that when we get to heaven, we go straight in. We can get the real fast track into heaven. And that's love. Love is the fast track into heaven. Um, that's the real fast track into heaven. <laughs> Just makes me think like our NDEs are this great, big, huge box of crayons. And, you know, one may not like that color. Somebody else may absolutely love that color. You know, these stories are yep. for different kinds of people. They're not just for one type person to get. Well, well, for someone, I had somebody tell me, they're like, I don't understand it. So many people have told me to read this book and I've read it three times and it doesn't speak to me at all. And I told them, I'm like, that's like someone saying you need to go to Baskin Robbins and only try chocolate ice cream and only chocolate ice cream. I'm like, and, and you know, chocolate's gonna be the right flavor for one person, and many people, they don't even like ice cream. So it's like, you know, there's different flavors for everybody, there really is. And is this the flavor for everybody? No, but, but what's neat about it is if it speaks to you, it really speaks to you. Yeah, now what about your buddy? Did he get sick inside the restaurant? And he did, but he was fine, they actually got him you know, he didn't die at all. He, he, because he didn't aspirate, you know, what killed me was my aspirating or, or suffocating on my own vomit, but they got him right away. They pumped his stomach and they, they did keep him overnight. Um, but they let him go the very next morning. So he was let go on, you know, this, we were admitted on a Saturday morning. He was let go Sunday morning. And then I was let go on, uh, you know, the three to two more days after that. So, yeah. Were you guys at the same hospital? Yeah, same hospital. Yeah, same hospital. And two two ambulance crews too. One brought him and turned him in, and then uh, you know forty five almost forty five minutes to an hour later, the other crew showed up for me. So um, yeah, it was it was it was a miracle. Absolutely, both of us to survive was a miracle. Yeah. My son Jeremy, he took a supplement several years ago, and driving back home from where he's working out at. He started feeling really sick and he ended up in the hospital. Nothing like what you had, but he got very ill. Yeah, it's, it's important that it's important when we're doing supplementation, when we're taking anything in our body, that we fully check in with your own intuition before you put it in your body. Because when it's when it's not synchronizing, when it's when it's not going to serve a higher purpose for you, you have an intuition in you. 
that's going to help you feel, don't do this. And even if you spent a lot of money on it, don't use the, the judgment of I spent a lot of money on this or because maybe someone told you, you should take this. Don't, if, if your body is and your intuition is telling you don't do this, then follow that. There's some, some eternal truth to that. It's going to lead to your higher life, your higher being, your higher existence to follow that intuition. And uh, for me, I had that. I actually had that. I remember when I first held the bottle, I'm like, this feels heavier or more dense than the normal bottle we get. And then also when I first tasted it, it felt oily. And the normal one that we took, it, it, it tasted like lemon juice, but it didn't, didn't have like an oiliness to it. But this one did. And I thought, well, maybe that's just the Thai recipe because it was bought from Thailand, you know, and, and, and come to find out the, the, the strength that you buy overseas was 100% strength and the strength in the United States was a 5% strength. So it was like taking 20 times the dose of a normal American dose. So it was quite different. And I should have followed that intuition when I, when I felt the heaviness of the bottle, but I didn't, you know, I, I've learned that intuition is very, very important for us. Did you guys sue the company or contact them or? Um, so we did some initial contact to them. And r- right after that, there was, there was actually a bunch of us. When I say us, this company started selling it out of Thailand, but it was an American company who set up their website to distribute it out of Thailand. And they, they actually closed their website right after, like within a couple of months. So I think there was a lot of people that ended up getting that first batch and didn't know that, that it was much stronger because it came with Thai writing all over the bottle, you know? Yeah. I used to work at an emergency room and a couple of times there was several people coming all in one night. They got sick at say one certain restaurant. Mm-hmm. That, and then that one happens, night, you know, one night we had uh, several people come in, they would be outside, whether ball game or doing whatever. And we don't know why, but this one night, these bugs was in their ears. They come in holding their head, screaming in pain and didn't know what was wrong. And they all had these bugs in their ears. It was just one night. Wow. That's interesting. I, I pick up something off of that, but we'll have to have a conversation later about that. But yeah, you know what? Um, it's, it's very weird how um, that intuition is, is important for us though to, to follow because it's there for a reason. It's going to keep us out of danger. It's going to, it's going to help us. It's going to serve us. It's going to um, help, help serve our higher, better, or, or our better, better being our better existence here. Yeah. Now these 10 principles, do you teach a class in this or? I do. I actually do one-on-one coaching. I do also a retreat um, occasionally where I'm, I'm, I'm teaching these principles for a few days uh, because really I can teach for hours on every single principle. Um, in, in fact, one, one principle that's really um, important to me is called is, is in, in the part where we, we use technology responsibly and we avoid negative influences I follow um, a plan called the hour of power. And what that is, is that's honoring very, very lovingly honoring the first 30 to 60 minutes when you wake up and the first 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed. So, or sorry, the last 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed. So the first 30 to 60 and the last 30 to 60 of your day, what you put in that space is who or what you are worshiping. So if you want to worship God, you need to put a space or a sacredness there that you can connect to God. Um, however you connect to God, if you do it through meditation or do it through prayer or reading Holy scripture or, or, you know, diving through the Torah or, or, or um, the Quran or whatever, whatever your religion speaks to um, make sure that in your hour of power in that divine time that you're putting only sacred things. Because if you're, as soon as you wake up, if you grab the news or you grab the sports or you grab Instagram or you grab Twitter, you grab whatever, that is your religion. That is what you are worshiping because that is a sacred time. And that's a time where you get to choose what goes in there because we do create our own universe. We create our own world, our, the, the way we live and how we live, our environments. Um, we can choose at this space in the sacred hour of power, what goes there. And it's life changing for people to even hear that and and embody it and understand it. It's life changing. And part of that principle is also, if you say you don't have a problem with something, I challenge you to fast 
from whatever you don't have a problem with. And if you cannot touch something or not eat something or not drink something for three days or heaven forbid, seven days, then you know you are not addicted to it. You're not attached to it, right? But most of us, our technology, our, our entertainment, um, our foods, our convenient foods, if we, if, if we can't go three days without it, we're tech to me, to energetically, we are addicted to it. So that, that, that serves to help us understand who's really in power, the device the or the technology or the phone, whatever, or us. We get to choose and, and we can consciously choose what goes in our hour of power. We can consciously choose how much time and what time we elect or allow ourselves to have access to technology, whether it's for work or for leisure or for whatever. We are the masters. We are. The, the technology and the life is not the master of us. We can be the master of it. So it's important for us to embody that and understand it. And, and I do. I teach people one-on-one. I do coaching. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing for everybody because um, I expect results if people want to get involved. It's a very um, synchronistic relationship where as long as the results continue where they they continue with the challenging and I continue with challenging with them that we grow together. And a lot of times the challenges I give them are the same challenges I give myself. So I get to grow with them, which is really neat too. So yeah, is I do that. that online? And I, it is, it's, it, I do it via zoom most times okay. uh, where possible. I do live in Las Vegas. So I do it, you know, person to person here in the local area. Um, but I also do it online too via zoom. Yeah. What about your retreats? So the retreats, we do that. Uh, so far, we're, we're just doing it once a year right now. Um, our next one, I think, is, is scheduled for August of uh, 2023. And it's up near Zions Canyon. Um, we do a four day at a ranch up there. And uh, we really focus on breathing, meditation, uh, recognizing the 10 principles, how to embody them. We, we do a little class on each of the 10 principles, as well as... Um, we have some some kind of life hacks and, and life teaching that we bring along the way of how to essentially help raise your frequency, help raise your love energy in your life. And, and people really come away transformed. Um, we've been doing this for years, kind of piggybacking on other retreats, you know, where we'd come and, and just be facilitators and work there. But um, but now we're, we're actually doing our own now. So. Um, that'll be coming up this August. We're either late July or August. We haven't set the date yet because there's we're still building the list of who's going to go. So. Is this your first one to have your own? It is, yes. Yeah. So this one's going to be our first one, just our standalone <laughs> one, yeah. But we're ready for it. It's fun. <laughs> it's actually a lot of fun. I love it, yeah. So do you speak at churches or groups and stuff too? Or I do. I've stopped doing it since we did the book. And the reason why is um, I still speak to, um, to big groups. I just don't facilitate it necessarily through churches. I haven't shut that off as an option. It's just it, it, it stopped kind of coming to me as the book came out because then people could access the story via the book, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. So I still do did it. Did churches I, I, receive NDE? They do. So there's a lot of churches, um, uh, specifically Christian affiliated. And, and actually with one little group, it was a, a Hindu group that I spoke with. Um, that one was a smaller group that wasn't very large, but the, the larger groups that I've spoke with were primarily Christian. Yeah. But it just really depends on the pastor or, or who, who the leader of the, that, that congregation is. Uh, some of them really love the experience. What I love now is now I have the book. If, if someone has that request, I say, well, we'll read the book first. If, if you, that really synchronizes with who you are, then let's go ahead and set something up. Because I've had experiences before where the congregation loves it, but maybe the clergy doesn't. And they're a little upset with me or something. And, and I don't want that. I want, you know, synchronistic loving energy um, for all. So anybody who wants to do it, I say, hey, read the book. Um, I'll even send them a book for free so they can they can read it. And then if it embodies their, their belief system and they feel it honors it, then we'll go ahead and set that up. Cause I don't want to uh, cause any, any uh, dismay in their own congregations. Yeah. Interesting. My book has so much child abuse and domestic violence and um, child protection work and everything. You know, it's just 
not just the indie ebook. It's not this beautiful poetic, you know, experience. <laughs> and just, so, yeah, like acquired taste, you know, just whatever you, you know, uh, moves people, I guess. But yeah, and it, it's kind of funny. I had one group where um, I did a, a thing for their audience, which was in the millions, and and the pastor who is in charge of it recorded it to all this. He's like, you know, he felt like it, it disempowered him. It took power away from him. And so he, he kind of 86, the whole operation. And, and so since then I'm very, very cognizant about it. It's not for everybody. It really isn't, but, but I love those who do find the story and read it and it connects to them. Many of them, many of them say it really speaks to their soul and I think the reason it does is because it's it's eternal principles. It's eternal things that we all know deep within us. And it's funny, the resonating effect of that. Some people hate it in the beginning. And then later they come back to me and they're like, you know what? I felt like you were a jackass for saying this. But now I honor you and I respect you because it's changed me. They even say it. They're like, I tried to ignore it for months. And then months later, I'm like, I can't run away from this. This guy had to be right because it's bugging me so bad. And and I tell them, like, I'm not sharing my experience. I'm sharing, I'm sharing all of this stuff happened to me, but that stuff is there. That whole experience was there outside of me before I got there. So that, you know, it's not me. It's not my opinions. It's truly my experience. It's what, what was already there, you know? And, and uh, I tell them, like, you can't debate my experience. It is what it is. <laughs> and and uh, I love it, though. It's, I, I say to a lot of my friends, that I had to die to learn how to live. And it's very true. It's very, very true. I was, you know, at, at a very young age, at a very high level of success, working in, in a, a, a high paced industry. And, and I got to that level and I was surrounded by what I thought were friends. And I had very little real friends around me. I had, a, I had people who wanted to use me, but not real friends. And, and what I've learned from my experience is that that I could have built a completely different life back then if I'd known about these principles, if I'd known how to embody love and, and build that love and, and number one, love myself before I can love anyone else. Um, and that's where we, we begin to actually grow as human beings here is, is we got to love ourselves. Otherwise we can never have a healthy relationship outside of us until we love ourselves first. And, and once we do, then we can start having healthy relationships. That's how it works. That's, that's the name of the game, uh, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> How do you feel when you tell your experience? I love it. Um, it's weird. I get this very high vibration or high energy, and it gets so much so that sometimes my body starts to cramp, like uh, get Charlie horses or cr muscle cramps. So I, I keep close a little jar of orange juice and waters so that as it starts to happen, I'm just sucking it <laughs> That's the only thing. Like, that's... And, and what they call that is they call it an electrolyte imbalance. So my, my body kind of has an electrolyte imbalance only when I'm sharing the experience. And the reason why is I get so excited, I get a little short on my breaths. So I do have to calm myself down, take some deep breaths, because um, as I do that, it, it kind of shortens the oxygen, goes to the imbalance of the electrolytes, and I got to drink some orange juice and, and uh, wow. pump some water. <laughs> I wonder if it has anything to do with that claustrophobic feeling you had when you. Oh, it could come it, back. absolutely. Because I still am. I still am. I'm not as bad. I'm not near as bad as before. Meditation has got has served me very very well since my experience. I'm I'm someone that if I don't meditate, it's like not breathing for me. So it's it's a daily and it's a must. It has to happen every day. I had, do I put rules around it where it has to be exactly like this? No. I just make sure that I connect to my, my, my creator every day. I connect every day, uh, morning, noon, night. I'm connecting all day sometimes, uh, at least a couple times a day, every day. And I make sure that, that that bridge or connection is all the time. And I notice my, the time I have the hardest time with emotions, with possible depression, that kind of stuff. It's when I'm not connecting. Yeah. It's when I'm not plugged into my creator. Yeah. Cause when I'm plugged in, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. Do you still connect to Drake? I do. Absolutely. Well, I would say daily. He shows up every day. Um, I don't call him out by name anymore because he's kind of like, he's kind of like the wallpaper of my existence. He's always there in a loving presence. 
And what's really neat though, is I've actually had quite a few people reach out to me and say, they've connected to him since too. So people have been in their own prayers, their own meditation, and they feel, they feel his presence and they kind of do a little communication of, Hey, I, I love your story. And thanks for doing this for Vinny. And, and thanks for bringing him back and, um, and facilitating this. And they, they get their own answers. Like they have questions that they can't get to me for somehow or, uh, but but later I find that they get their questions answered before they could get me to answer it from him. So he also helped Lynn, my my uh, co-author on this. He essentially um, penned this himself. You know, Drake did with us. So Drake was very much a part of the writing process. Yeah. I never thought about that before. I mean, I have said that when I grabbed my laptop that day and I just started writing, I had no intention to. I just had like this vision. I just I just it all it all started making sense. I started writing and I visualized someone standing at the other side of my laptop looking at me and it's like, I'm just telling it to them. And I just kind of yep. kept that. And I never thought about that before. Like maybe it was some spirit there or something. It was. Yeah. I see. I see really strongly for you in that process. There was a spirit on the receiving end, like giving you the incentive, Hey, you need to write this story for me. But more importantly, there was a team behind you with all of them, their hands on your shoulders, bringing it through you. So do you, can, team. Do since you had all that, um, cause I had that during my drowning too, that connection to everybody's thoughts. Um, yeah. Mine was above the pond hovering there, not, you know, right there at my body, but hovering and then running down the highway and stuff. But there was voices that would come in and then there was this, um, two boys walking along the road and I just start, Hey, where are you going? Huh? Huh? What are you doing? And the younger one started talking telepathic. Oh, we've been fishing. We're in a hurry home, you know? And so I've wondered since, is that why sometimes I don't like really pick up people's thoughts, but more of emotions. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so absolutely. So you did that. After and, you, you. And, and it's kind of like, here's the thing. Once you step outside the physical body and you allow your soul to be itself, and then you force the soul back into the body you still keep some of your inherent traits that your soul has always had. And that's the ability to communicate um, without words. And so, yes, all, I would say, well, here's the thing. A hundred percent of us can do this, communicate to each other in a loving frequency. And, and here's where it's present. When you get a husband and a wife or maybe a team that works together really well, when they lovingly work together, they'll hand each other stuff. They'll, you'll see it in surgery mm -hmm. sometimes. A good surgeon has a nurse right there. She's handing them the tool before he asks for it. She's at that same frequency as him. And they're working in one love frequency to serve the patient, right? And, and you see this happening in life, in marriages, in mm -hmm. partnerships, in business. And that's what's happening. There's a nonverbal communication, an ESP going on. And, and, it, and it focuses on love, the love of, of purpose, the love of, of synchronicity or uh, uh, kismet. Um, or br coming together in perfection. And, and that's what it's all about. We all have that. And, and that's one of the things I do is I teach people to turn that on. I teach people how to better connect to their own guidance team because we do all have spiritual teams to help us, every single one of us. Even if you feel you're the most alone person in the whole world, you're not. You have an entire team there. And, and I call them unemployed angels. There's angels out there for everybody that um, we need to call on them and get them uh, working for us, get them, um, they, they can't help us unless we ask. So it's important that we use prayer, we use meditation, we use intention to create our reality, create our life and, and create the help that we want. And the help shows up. You put, you know, you knock, the door opens. And, and that's in many scripture, knock and it shall be opened unto you. And that's, that's a truth, an absolute eternal truth. Um, ask for the help, the help shows up. Um, I call it radar love with me and my husband after the song radar love. It's just yeah. kind of that one will just think of something and we'll both say, you know, this is the kind of in sync thing or he'll say, did you just yell? I'm like, <laughs> no, but I, I think in my head, I did, you know, this crazy thing or my sons, if I'm really missing them really bad, I'm really concentrating, focusing on them. They'll call me. And it just mm -hmm. feels like they sent something like I, I just, I, for some reason you call mom out of the blue. <laughs> So, well, I've, I've played with it over the years in a really fun, playful way where I've realized that I can help communicate with people using that, using that love energy 
Uh, one example is uh, we were over in this this place over by where I live. It's a little little village called uh, Lake Las Vegas, and we were out there doing um, a little maternity photo shoot for my wife. And as we were doing it, we were on this grand staircase, and there's all these people all over. And I asked my team, I said, you know what? We would love a picture where there was no people, and they wouldn't let us rent out this space for the picture, that, but we wanted this staircase. So I asked every guide around me that I could perceive, can we please lovingly clear this stairway so that my wife could just get a couple of snaps real quick, and then we'll be on our way? And within seconds of that thought, going to my team and my team reaching out to all the people around. They literally, it was as if they didn't know what was moving them. They all just started clearing away from the, the stairs and the steps and we got our picture. And then I, I put the, the loving release that, hey, come on back in guys. And they all came back in and it was really a beautiful thing. And it was as if the stairway went out of order, like, like people couldn't use it for those you know couple of minutes while we were taking our pictures. And as soon as it was over, it all went back to normal. It was, and I've, I've had, and that was one experience where I'd been doing it for a long time when I did that. Um, I've realized that sometimes I'll be at someone's house and, hey, that, that cabinet needs to close. I'll ask who's next to it. Hey, will you close that cabinet? But I don't ask them with my mouth. Within seconds, they'll just reach up and close it. And over time, I've, I'll go and, and ask them, why did you close that cabinet? They're like, I don't know. I just, I felt like I needed to close. I'm like, you didn't even look at the cabinet you reached behind you and, and closed it. And they're like, yeah, that was weird. I just knew it was open behind me. I don't know how. It, and it, I mean, our consciousness is so beautiful and so amazing. And I've watched it many times with, um, I've, I've taught my wife to do the same thing and, and even my daughter and, and we're teaching my son um, about the, the multiverse, the, the fact that we have so much to our consciousness that it is truly unlimited. Um, there's beautiful things that we can do with this and we can love and serve so many people with this. Um, we do energy work for people when, you know, someone asks for us to do energy work for someone in their family. We do some, some work there. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. There's so much that I have yet to learn, but yet there's so much that, that we can learn together as a team of, of team earth, you know, family here on earth learning about each other and helping each other and, and serving to lovingly create here. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I love it when, you know, in the ears, you know, we may be afraid to talk about our NDE or not have the opportunity, but once we start getting in that swing, it's like things evolve, like with what you're doing now and, you know, stuff that I do with it. And then I, Oh, now I want to do this with it. And it's, it's, it just becomes like this art form of expressing ourselves and helping other people yeah um, and what, and what's kind of funny what's kind of funny with it too is we we set like a plan or an expectation and then god kind of chuckles and god's like oh that's funny they think that's how it's going to happen and then god shows you how it's going to happen and and many times it doesn't go according to plan but it's important that we make the plan and and do it without expectation necessarily we can program an expectation I expect this to happen, God. Help me do it. Might serve my higher purpose to make this happen, and then leave it to God. Let it to God. And as we move forward, what happens is the right path for us. And even mm -hmm. sometimes it means it means closing a little door in front of you because there's a big door opening behind you. And that happens many, many times. I can't tell you how many times I had a little door closed in front of me, only to have my spirit team tell me, "Hey, turn around." look at the huge opportunity behind you to help other people. And that's where I find just beautiful bliss in this life is yeah. there in, in, never in, seen. in connecting with, with that there is a higher purpose to all of this, even, even the, the all the craziness going on in the news, there is a higher purpose. Mark my words. Um, there's so much light coming to this planet, coming to our, our humanity on this planet. It might not seem so, but I'm telling you, unplug from the news, unplug from all that negative energy and seek out that light because it's coming and it's already here. It's already here. It's, it's purging the earth. It's helping upgrade the earth itself. And uh, we're going to see it more and more and more as we go in the next coming years. There's, there's some really beautiful things ahead for us on this earth. I know in my community, it's really bonded people like it, like when this you know covid stuff started you know just an old man walking up to a restaurant or somebody's relieving a gas station we just get talking 
and we're just so like-minded about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And to me, it really has brought out, wait a minute, we cherish the old ways. We cherish the old mm -hmm. morals and values and, and we're mm -hmm. all going to start, you know, without really talking about, you know, we're going to, we're going to start standing up for those things. And it is, it's important that we embody truth and we embody authenticity. That's it. Yep. Well, I thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peggy. Story. Yeah. I appreciate okay. your story and, and I would love to get a, um, you know what, if you have an extra or no, you said you could send me a digital copy, I can, right? Is, I, can, I can send it to you. If, if you don't mind, I send it to people um, in an email. My main oh, perfect. If you could put yeah. it in a Kindle like that. Okay, perfect. That's what I'll do. That'll be awesome. Okay. I'd love to read it. Okay, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thank you so I'll much, Peggy. And I'll send you a copy of my book too. So I'll, Thank I'll, you. Uh, I'll get that in the, in the snail mail. I'll get it in the snail mail today. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks. Have, have, a, have a blessed day, okay? You too. Bye-bye.